Awesome. Well, we're here today with Paul, and I am very lucky because I get the privilege of working with you, Paul. And I've been able to hear a little bit about your story, um, the watered down version. Um, but how about you tell us all about your story? So, um, I migrated to New Zealand when I was 18 months old. Mm -hmm. um, we moved to Rotorua um, from a young age, I guess, because I had a a really thick English accent and it was um, quite a, a mouldy cultured city to move to. Yeah. Um, wow. It was just really, really different. It was yeah. like a massive, massive culture shock I remember growing up. Um, always felt like there was um, just a piece missing inside of me, just this missing hole. I felt like a mm. really strange kid, like I didn't fit in. Wow. And, um, really gravitated towards um, Māori straight away as well because they were, they seemed like the minority. Yeah. And, um, wow. yeah, just to um, mischief as well. Mm. I just, um, that's where I felt like I fitted in, just playing up and, and so forth. So So you grew up in Rotorua? Yeah, grew up in Rotorua, yep. I um, went to a Catholic school yep. and there was sisters, it was run by Sisters of Mercy. Mm -hmm. wow. So there was um, a, a convent on the ground and, um, they were pretty hard ladies. Uh, I've heard them being called Sisters of No Mercy. So <laughs> they are, um, yeah. It was the last year that corporal punishment was in too. And yeah. I remember I, I used to get singled out. We used to have to stand in a in a circle and, and, and read out of a book. And mm. um, that's how I'd, get in, I'd be getting words wrong because my English accent. And so yeah. I'd stand mm. there with a big two meter ruler and like whacking the back of your wow. legs. And how old are you? Um, 40, I think. Yeah. 40. Yeah. Wow. 40, yeah. yeah. Coming up 40. Yeah. 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 So, um, this really knocked my self esteem. Yeah. yeah. Um, really low self esteem and wow. um, behavioral issues as well. Mm. Um, really loving family, like, yeah. um, such yeah. a, such a beautiful family, never went short of anything. And, um, yeah. I loved attention, any kind of attention. Mm. So this was uh, really just me being the class clown, I was always in mm. trouble. Um, progressed a few years, went to a, a Catholic secondary school yeah. and I have two older sisters and um, both of them are drug addicts as well. Wow, yeah, still. Yeah, still an addiction. Um, my parents went out one night and my sister um, just rolled a joint and I smoked a joint with her and um, I sort of felt like that missing piece that I'd always been looking for. Mm. I just, I, yeah, I found that missing piece, like there was this hole in my heart and, and it sort of felt like it had been filled. Yeah. So um, I was like full on into skateboarding since I was a young kid. So started smoking dope and then my schoolwork and everything fell off. All I wanted to do was just go skating all day and, and get high and just mm. like any, any, any addiction that just progressed from like smoking dope on the weekends to a few times a week and then it was just every day mm. um, and then schoolwork everything fell away so forth and um just really started partying hard mm. wow. um, just drinking on the weekends even from that early age i think it was quite a big telltale as to how my life was going to be when i'm look, looking back at it like mm. i'd be the the last to stop drinking, mm. always drink to blackout and mates would be getting up for breakfast in the morning and that'd be me, I wouldn't worry about breakfast, I'd just crack open a beer straight away and get into it. Mm. Um, then I started using, um, experimenting with um, harder drugs, so taking a lot of acid, magic mushrooms, um, ecstasy, uh, meth wasn't around back then, so it was just like, um, just speed. Um, yeah, just really progressed. Uh, ended up leaving school at the age of uh, 16, I think it was, 17, wow. and did a course of Polytech, um, worked for about six months mm. in uh, the catering, uh, oh, oh, sorry, hospitality in industry, mm -hmm. and um, just couldn't be bothered with it, I'd rather just party all the time. Yeah. So um, my parents ended up moving over to the Mount, so I followed them over. And it was New Year's of 1999. Okay. And um, I was going to go get some pills for New Year's. 
and um, my mate didn't have any, he said he had some meth. So um, I was like, oh yeah, cool whiz. And so um, I ended up getting a quarter of a gram and saved it for New Year's Eve and, and snorted it and I just felt like I was home. It was like filled with confidence. Um, everything I've been searching for my whole life, mm. I, I found it in that bag. And um, wow. I ended up being awake for about three days because I didn't have any tolerance to it. And then I had to sleep and then I was just back there getting more. Mm. Same thing. Uh, so just, it was the beginning of the end? Yeah, it was the beginning of the end pretty much. Yeah. Um, wow. Same thing. Um, weekend use and that started um, just going to like um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then before I knew it, I was just using every day. Mm. Wow. Um, one of my best mates at the time, his um, his brother-in-law, he was quite older than us. He was um, getting quite large amounts brought down from Auckland, mm. and so um, I started selling for him to support a habit. Yeah. And I went up to his house one day to get more gear, and he was sitting at um, the dining room table, and I just walked in from the curtains back, and he had a, um, a syringe out and wow. um, spoon and stuff just as kit. And he was mixing up a shop, and I was quite taken back. I'd never seen anything like that. And he just said to me, um, well, this is how we do it. And um, he mixed me up a shot and um, gave me my first shot of meth. Mm. And um, I just couldn't believe the feeling, like, mm. just the taste that I got at the back of my mouth. So every single hair in my body just standing up, and I just um, I fell in love with shooting meth. Wow. And, um, how old were you at that point? 22, 22, yeah. Wow. Um, but then this time, um, my crime really stepped up. Mm. Um, doing a lot of burglaries, then started getting into commercial burglaries. Wow. Met a young lady and um, ended up getting her pregnant. She was quite young. She ended up with a quite a large meth habit as well. And I got given an ultimatum, uh, either, either go get clean or uh, have nothing to do with this um, this child. So I uh, went to my first resi residential treatment centre up in Auckland. Mm. Um, I was sitting in the waiting room when I got there and um, there was a lady sitting next to me and she was um, she was a hooker who had just moved back from King's Cross and wow. we just we just clicked clicked off straight away. And um, yeah, I ended up leaving with her and um, we came back down to the mount and then we moved back or we moved up to Auckland and that's when I first got a, a taste of the scene and scene in Auckland this is in about 2004 I think something like that mm. and um, I just fell in love with the with the scene in Auckland mm. City it was just so fast um, just the whole scene of working girls and meth yeah. and all that and um, she was uh, an opiate addict and she, she um, showed me how to turn um, morphine sulfate tablets into diamorphine, so I ended up wow. with, a, with a morphine habit as well. Wow. Wow. Um, I started to go downhill uh, physically really quick, um, mm. getting really sick, so one day I just decided to leave, came back down to the mount, getting into the same stuff. Um, fast forward a few years, did my first um, lag in Waikiria prison, Mm. Um, sentenced, I think it was unlawfully taking a motor vehicle and just a raft of theft, theft charges. So that was um, a massive shock going to, um, to jail. Mm. But when I got arrested, I was, I was, I was pleased because um, it's such a draining lifestyle just trying to support a habit every single yeah. day and everything that goes with it. Mm. So I was about 49 kgs when I went to jail. Wow. wow. Um, there was 100 and, 125 uh, people in our unit put together, and only um, I think five of us were white. So it was wow. um, it was um, it was good character building, and that was for sure. Mm, uh, yeah, it was good. It was uh, I had a lot of mates in there from back home, so it was it was pretty sweet. So while I was in there, a lady started coming in and liaising with me because they knew all of my offending was because of um, my meth addiction. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I got released early and sent to Higher Ground, a treatment facility in Auckland. Um, I think I got kicked out after about 
70 days because I was too too aggressive. Mm. I know that anger is just a secondary emotion, mm. and it was all just coming from a place of hurt. I was just wow. um, I was just hurting so bad. And, um, wow, secondary emotion. That's so true. Eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they say anger, correct me if I'm wrong, is like at the peak. Yeah. So like, so they say with like uh, my kids, like say Huey, my son gets mm-hmm. frustrated. He's not frustrated and we, we think, oh, it's so irrational that you're frustrated because you can't have an ice block. But he's not frustrated. He's not getting angry because of the ice block. He's mm-hmm. getting angry because he's, um, his teacher said something yeah. or he didn't yeah. get what he thought in his mm-hmm. lunchbox or that, and it builds, builds, builds and then he gets that place. That triggers him. Yeah. That triggers him. So it's like so many deeper mm-hmm. emotions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I believe that there's like way more triggers leading up to that point mm-hmm. of being angry. Wow. Definitely, mm-hmm. yeah. So um, he got kicked out of there and got put in a supported living house because it was part of my release conditions. Yeah. Same and were you, thing. were you using it this time? Yeah, how no, I, I, got, I got clean, so I was like 70 days clean, Oh yeah. plus my time in jail. Yeah. Um, then I met someone there, always just gravitate to um, people that are up to no good, and I yeah. always think it just comes back to self-esteem as yeah. well, just like, I accept, like I'm accepted by those people. So um, mm. we just got up to mischief straight away, we just started doing burglaries, uh, burglaries all around um, Mount Eden area, mm. and started just swapping everything we're getting for gear. And we ended up getting um, that house raided. Um, Auckland CIB ended up coming around and, and raiding that place. Mm. They didn't find anything. And then um, they suspected we were up to something. So um, I ended up getting kicked out of there. My probie was sweet. So I thought I'd do a, a geographical and try and run from my problems. So I went down to Christchurch. Mm. <laughs> um, same thing, it was like, Everywhere I used to go, I'd just like gravitate towards whatever people were up to. And, um, Your problems followed you? Yeah, my problems just followed me. So mm. I stayed down there for a bit, then thought I'd try and run from my problems again. So I came back up to um, back up to the mount, and um, same thing, picked up where I left off. Habit was just growing more and more and more. Wow. And then, so you um, got clean, and then you got, obviously, you're back on it. Yeah, then, I was yeah. clean, like, while I was in jail, and wow. then while I was in this rehab, and then, so yeah, just back on it. What is it, was it like a conscious thought of like, this is going to continue to destroy my life if I pick up again, or was the addiction just too loud? I wasn't done. Yeah. I, wasn't yeah. Done. I knew in my heart that I wow. wasn't done, eh? it, was just wow. like, it was just like ticking boxes, it was mm. like, yeah, sweet wow. In my mind it was like, cool, have a break, um, get back out and get back into it. Wow. Um, yeah, so. Same thing, got in, got back into the scene up here. Um, and then it was around 2010. I was going through the roundabout at um, Hewlett's Road by KFC. Yeah. And um, I ended up, hadn't been, hadn't slept for about a week. And I T-boned a car and ended up severing a girl's leg tendons. <sighs> um, so I got put in remand for a bit, chucked back into higher ground. Um, this time I actually graduated. And I had this picture in my mind that, like, um, if I got a partner who didn't use drugs, if I moved to the country, had like a, a veggie garden, a nice little cottage with us. I think we all even do that as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, like run then, away. I'd, then I'd be sweet. And, yeah, um, life would be good. Life would be good, yeah. So I got all those things. And um, Did you was, have a veggie garden? Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. Where did you live in the country? Uh, Pera Mahoi. Wow. Uh, yeah, wow. Just between uh, Pukakoi and Waiuku. Um, straight, as, straight as Mrs. at the time, uh, engaged to be married. Um, still just this massive missing piece inside of me. Wow. Mm. Yeah, still yeah. So um, I was still pretty skinny back then. Mm. So um, uh, some mates started encouraging me to go to the gym. And I got a job in the bush. I was earning really good money. Um, started going to the gym and my uh, personality it's just like all or nothing so if, yeah. I, if I pick something up I just go handy yeah. yeah so I started seeing a nutritionist um, <laughs> <laughs> like full on like weighing out all my food diet plans all of that strict training regime and then um, I went and see my nutritionist one day and she said um, there's actually a way that we can get you bigger and I said, oh yeah, well, how's oh, that? Wow. And she said, um, mm-hmm. said there's this stuff called Dianabol, which is an oral steroid. 
So, um... How wow. long had you been clean for? Probably about two years at this stage. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I started using Diana Bowl and um, that was like my new obsession, my new addiction. It was just like working, buying and selling cars because it was the closest thing I could get to um, selling drugs. Mm. Just trying to make money um, and just gymming it hard up and, and, and trying to get as big as I could. So after this first cycle, I went back to this nutritionist and her mm. husband was there and um, it was like, oh, you got good gains from that. Are you ready for the for the big boy stuff? And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, oh, we can start doing injectables if you want. So um, I ended up actually finding out the source of where they're getting this from. It was from the gym I was actually training at. So I became uh, good mates with this guy. And he started doing me these massive stacks. And I, um, I got up to, uh, I think it was 102 kgs. Wow. So I got pretty big, and it was the same From thing. From 49 kgs, like, yeah, back then, I, like, you know. Yeah, I used to, like, like, fluctuate between, like, yeah. 50, 55 kgs up to 60. So, um, it just got massive, and that was, like, my new addiction, was just trying to get as wow. big as big as I could. Um, that really started to trigger me, and this relationship started falling apart. Mm. I was meant to marry her. I just... Um, yeah, it just wasn't working. And just the fact of that I'd been a junkie for years and sitting at home with like a, a box of three mil syringes, it was just, um, it was just wrong. So wow. I was doing like 12 step meetings in that time. Mm. And I just felt like a hypocrite going to them saying I was clean, but um, every second day I was using um, steroids and you know, pinning in my, um, in my quads and in my delts and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, this relationship fell apart. Wow. I ended up moving back to the city mm. and um, got a job painting for this uh, this Australian guy who had also just moved back from King's Cross. Mm. And he got to know a bit about my past and um, knew I had a few connections in Auckland. So he, um, he said, how about we start um, a bit of a side business? Mm. And he started fronting me um, money for large, quite large quantities of meth. Mm. And... Um, I probably sold meth successfully for about four weeks mm. and um, every time I'd just be sitting with a, a, a bag in front of me and I'd just be like, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I. Mm. I got a new partner with him this time yeah. and um, she was clean as well, she didn't use drugs and I was around at a mate's apartment and um, I think it was a Sunday night and I just said to my, um, my, my ex, I said I'll just have one line. And she was like, well, I don't think it's a good idea. And I was like, that'll be sweet. Mm. So I had a line about four hours later. I'd, I'd used a gram. And then um, next thing, it's Thursday morning. Yeah. I was sitting in the shed with um, old acquaintances and I was back on the needle. Wow. Mm. Um, my mental health really started going. Yeah. Mm. So from all the years of um, intravenous drug use, um, I started experiencing bad, psych bad psychosis. Yeah. Wow. And I started drinking um, GBL as well, wow. which is like um, a date rape drug. Oh and my, um, my behavior just started getting really out there. It started mm. displaying like, um, we used to call it flapping out. And it was like, I used to have Tourette's, you know, like autistic kids yes. do. Yeah, yeah. So um, oh, she started getting over this. Um, she, yeah. she liked the money, but mm. she didn't like the person I was. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, I think I had, it was like five GBL overdoses in the space of one year. So how long was it? So you, you started injecting again? Yeah. And then were you consistently in a state of picking up? Yeah. Up until you got fully away. clean? That was it. I was just and playing. how long do you think that lasted? Four years. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And what happened in those last 12 months of that, of those last, that last year? Um, yeah. Psych wards. Um, Psych wards, did you say? Yeah, I started wow. getting um, placed under um, the mental, the mental health, health act and no. stuff like that. Wow. Um, that just gets sick of me in there because I'd go there and I'd be like, there's nothing wrong with me. Right. They'd be trying to give me like a lansapine and antipsychotics and stuff like that. And um, by the end of it, because I'd be getting drugs dropped off in there, 
They just be like, we just want you out of here. Mm. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they just say you're just a drug addict. There's nothing we can do. And I'd be like, yeah, that's cool. So um, my lifestyle really started taking its toll on my partner that I was with, mm. and um, she moved out and she moved in with her mum. Then I ended up moving in with her mum. And um, one night when I was in bed, um, I had a big dose of GBL and um, they couldn't wake me up, so they called the ambulance. Um, woke up with just like ECG monitors and stuff like that and came to, after about 10 minutes, I realised that I'd been drinking GBL. And this is just the power of addiction. Like, um, mm. as soon as I came to, I was like, I've got to get home. I've got to get on mm. it again. So, wow. me just thinking it's normal just um, getting in a, in a taxi at 4 a.m. and like one of those hospital mm. nightgowns, knocking on the door, just like, wow. hey, I'm home, babe, it's all good. And they're like, we can't do this anymore, you know? Like, we can't stand by and mm. watching you kill yourself. So, wow. they told me to leave. So, I was like, cool, where? So, I came back down to the mount and, um, my mental health really, really took a bad turn. My, um, I was staying at my parents' house in there in Australia um, on holiday. Mm. And I was thinking some really, really messed up stuff, really messed up. And mm. um, I couldn't handle it anymore. And I got into a real state of depression. Like, I wanted to stop so badly, but mm. like my body was so physically dependent. Yeah. It was like, If I didn't use, I couldn't function, yeah, I couldn't get yeah. out of bed or anything yeah. like that. And I had a had a had a shot of meth one morning and I just flipped something and just went off in my head and I was like, I can't do this anymore. Mm. I can't do it. Um, really, really casual, like it was like I was nesting, so like I cleaned the house, made my bed, all of that, and then just Googled what kind of pills to um to take to overdose. Wow. So <clears throat> Um, I ended up eating about, I think it was like 200 more triptyline oh. and about 50 codeines, um, just even more casual. I don't know, I jumped in the bathtub with no water, with like a bottle of juice and I was just popping out cards, mm. cards of pills and just eating handfuls of pills and then um, I could just feel myself fading and I just had this such, such a peace about me. I was like, great, you know, it's over, no mm. more pain, I'm yeah. done. Um, I left one window and the house open mm. and um my sister who lived on the same street she um she she reckoned she had a strange feeling mm. but uh, i know who that feeling would have been or mm. who that would have been yes. speaking to her yeah she came down and um she was banging on the doors no one had to answer so she chucked uh, her son through the window came and unlocked the door and she came into the bathroom and i was lying in the bathtub just covered in vomit, my wow. eyes roll back in my head. So um, the paramedics said if she hadn't found me within the next three minutes, I would have been dead. Wow. So ended up in a coma, I think it was four or five days. Um, and they thought there was going to be um, quite a, a strong chance that I'd have um, brain damage mm -hmm. if I made it out. Some of my mates who used to have addictions as well, found Christ within this time. Yeah, well. Wow. Mm. And they all rushed down from Auckland and they sat at my bedside for a couple of days just praying for me. Wow. Yeah. Um, one amazing. of my one of my good mates, um, he found Christ like six years before me. He, he was a, a meth addict as well. Um, when I was in this coma, God gave him a prophetic word. Mm. Um, wow. And he told me this when I came out of the coma. Either he told my mum or, or he told me, but he definitely told me when I came out of the coma. It's a prophetic word that um, God gave him. Um, he said to me, God spoke to me when you're in this coma, and he said that you're going to be, um, you're going to give your heart to Jesus. Um, mm. So simple. Yeah, so special. That I'd be leading a ministry mm. for people with addiction issues. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that I was going to be a pastor. Wow. And I am. Um, Did you believe him? <laughs> I was just like. <laughs> You're like, bro. I was just like, bro, what are you on about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, bro, what crazy. are you on about? And um, this mate never, ever gave up on me. Wow. Like, never gave up on me. There was wow. two people in my life. Like, when I came out of this coma, 
I got put in the psych ward and I made a promise with myself. I was like, I'm never ever using meth again. And um, within two weeks of being out of this coma, I was back on the meth. Um, yeah. yeah. My parents really just accepted my lifestyle. I think it was out of a place mm. of fear. I was living with them. They just used to just let whatever slide, um, but it really took their toll on them. Yeah. So I decided to go back to Auckland. I was going to do a medical detox. Wow. Um, just any way I could get off. Um, did a detox within a day I was using again. Wow. So, yeah. When, when I was, when, in that coma, it was like when I came out, it was like something that shifted in me. Yeah. And I felt like different and like even even though I was using meth, my mum was like, something seems different about you. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I feel different. And so I moved back to central Auckland and looking back now it was like I can see just how much God was preparing me and how yeah. much grace he was just pouring wow. upon me. And um on a few occasions I bumped into um mates that I, I knew from the addiction scene and um, that found Christ as well mm. and um, I remember one day I'd just gone down to the dairy and I was walking home and I, and I seen this guy Jeremy and um, him and his mate and I was in a good way and he said can I um, lay hands on you and pray for you and I was like yeah cool guys like I was just mm. really really open yeah. mm. and he laid hands on me and I was like yeah that's cool um, and then probably, probably half a year later, I, um, had just been on a big meth bender, had a big sleep and I was on K Road, just gone to the needle exchange, about to use, so I can't say that it was psychosis or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had an encounter with Jesus. Mm -hmm. What happened? So I was heading to the public toilet to use and um, I heard Jesus' voice. Mm. Wow. Mm. What did he say? Um, just warning me to um, get out of Auckland while you're still alive. And um, it was the first time I experienced uh, or got filled with the fear of God. Mm. Wow. And I was just like, there was something in me, I was like, it was such an authoritative voice wow. and I was like I've got to listen to this voice yeah. I've got to get out of here I just got yeah. to go yeah. and I literally like I had <laughs> like a clean syringe in my pocket a bag of meth and enough money to get a bus ticket mm. and I was literally sprinting through wow. Auckland CBD like like running to the bus station wow. I just got to go so I um, went to the bus station bought a ticket and um, came back down to the mount, it's like, mm. yeah, it's time to go home. Um, I was sitting in my mate's toilet in Arataki about to shoot some meth, and I heard this, um, this small voice whispering to me saying, um, this is the last time you'd be doing this. Mm. And um, like this massive sense of peace. Mm -hmm. And um, I just had this acceptance, I was like, it's done. Yeah. It's finished. That's it. I'm mm -hmm. completely done. So I went around to my parents' house. I hadn't seen them for a while. And um, I turned up on their doorstep and they just didn't know what to do. They just said I just looked like so disheveled, just like a, mm. just like a yeah, just, just a mess. So I um, ended up getting put back in the psych ward um, to do a medical detox. And um, they used to have like um, this wire to group every day. And I don't know, there was just like this hunger inside of me. This was like my thing. I used to go and they'd be like singing um, like Māori worship songs wow, and cool. karakia and stuff like that. Yeah. And this is so cool. Mm. So I was going there every morning and then um, it was like my third day I'd been in there and um, I was in my room and I had this this urge inside of me to get down on my knees and pray. Wow. And um, I, I didn't pray or anything like that. I had um, I'd been really put off by experiences with religious people mm. growing up mm. um, and I got down on my knees and 
I just looked at my hands in the air and I just said, I know you're out there, yeah. whoever you are. Can you just please just like um, give me the strength yeah. to just stay clean? I'm done. I don't want to be living this lifestyle anymore. Mm -hmm. I walked outside of um, the psych unit and standing there was um, one of my good friends, Tams, who I hadn't seen for probably over 10 years. And um, she was standing there in tears and she said, I'm three years clean. Mm. Um, let me off. Let me help you to get, you know, I'll, I'll help you to get clean. Her mum was actually staying in the psych ward at the time. Mm. So she called up her partner who was also a um, recovering meth addict. He came, picked me up and started taking me to 12 step meetings. Mm. And then um, I, was, I was just praying every day. I was like, yeah. Mm. I had this picture of like God was like this. I remember going to church as a kid and up on the, up on like the back of the church, there was like a stained glass window. And there was like this man with this like the staff and a, and a white robe and a big beard and I was mm. like, and my mind was like, yeah, that's who God is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just pictured myself praying, praying to this guy and um, then I was at a public forum one day and this lady from um, church, curate church came up to me and um, she said, um, I think she said to me, God told me to come and speak to you or something like that. Um, uh, I think you should come along to Curate Church and come to this group that we have. It was for people with um, addiction issues. It was, um, they're trying to start up Celebrate Recovery there. Mm -hmm. So me and a couple of mates went along and um, I met this guy there. I thought he was pretty cool. He's uh, one of my best mates now. His name is Will Perry. He was mm -hmm. on worship. And um, he was like, bro, you should come check out church. And I was like, yeah, for sure. Had you been to church at this point? No, I hadn't been to church. So I um, I walked into church and I got there kind of late and everyone was worshiping and um, it's like what are these weirdos doing? You know, it was like dark. <laughs> they had their hands in the air. And I, was I was like, man, this is weird. And, dark. Um, yeah. And I this just, is a bit weird, eh? I just stood there and I just closed my eyes and um, I was just in tears. Wow. I was just in tears and I was like, I. I could literally feel myself just being forgiven. Wow, that's amazing. Everything that I'd um, everything that I'd done, mm. just like all the shame leaving me. Wow. All this guilt just being lifted off wow. me, and just like almost just like this healing just taking place inside yeah. of me. Wow, that's amazing. Um, it came to the end. They did an altar call, and my hand was just up. And, um, and Will came up to me and he was like, bro, here's a Bible. He told me to just start reading in John. Oh, amazing. And um, I went back the next weekend and then he, he just started journeying with me. He started taking me out for coffees and stuff oh, like that. Wow, and amazing. Just really discipling me. And um, a couple of other people took me under their wing as well. Yeah. Um, very, very special um, couple, uh, Sherry and Rick. Mm. And... Um, one of the pastors at the time, uh, an old guy, uh, Peter Taylor, and um, they just just started loving on me, inviting me to their house, which was such a foreign thing, because yeah. Yeah. everyone was always like, get away, mm, like, get yes. away from me, and yeah. they were just like, come they were just closer. like, just come closer, you know, yeah. and just trusting me and stuff like that. And um, about th three weeks later, after I made that decision, um, it was baptisms yeah. and Will was like bro do you want to get baptised and I was like yeah I'm in mm. so I um, got baptised then this other lady um, from church um, she's called Tracy she came up to me and she gave me pretty much exactly the same prophetic word wow. that my mate um, that my mate Jay gave me and how long had it been between that prophetic word and this probably about two years wow, like wow amazing yeah um, started going to church uh, every weekend, just just loving it. All these cool connections being made, and people just loving on me, and I just wasn't yeah. used to it. Um, then God just started bringing all these people into my life who were suffering from a me uh, meth addiction and so forth. Wow. Um, I started bringing them to church, and I was like, pretty much for a whole year, I just laid this solid foundation where. I was single and I just built 
this relationship with God. Yeah. I just sit in my room Amazing. most of the day, just reading the Word and just speaking to Him. And He just like, wow. He really revealed to me who He is as a Father mm. yeah. um, and my true identity as His Son. And mm. it's like, yeah, just, just. Yeah, it just blew me away. Wow, that's so oh, that is so I love, like, as you're talking, I love, it's such a reminder. And lots of people who follow don't have a relationship with Jesus, but how kind he is. Mm. And actually, it's so not searching for perfection mm. at all. And you were in the midst of just, like, this deep, like, darkest time. Mm. And he picked you out and was like, you need to leave here. Yeah. And you need, like, he was watching you. Yeah. He cared for you. Mm. And he still had purpose for you. Mm. Yeah. In, in what lots of humans would look at and think, he's just going to kill himself, basically. Yeah. 100%. What he's yeah. doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. With all that's going on with um, now, you have such an awesome relationship with God mm -hmm. and you're helping other people who have been through Yeah, what journey. does your life look like now? Yeah. Now, now I'm uh, married. Way uh, so good. Yeah. How so many I'm years married. have you been married? Uh, coming up a year. Oh, yeah. Yep. Whoa, so, so good. Then a lockdown wedding. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Did you? Lockdown wedding on the oh. one. Yeah. I love that. So married? Yeah. Married, um, being blessed with two beautiful children, oh, two beautiful wow. boys, mm. um, whose dads don't want to be around. So Wow. So great. here you are. Yeah. Stepped um, up to the plate. Yeah. Stepped up to the plate. Um, now I'm a pastor at Curate Church. Wow. Um, and I lead a, a ministry called um, Curate Recovery. Wow. Yeah. And how do you make sure you don't slip into old habits? Mm, that's a good question. I believe there's, um, like, I read the scripture the other morning, I can't remember what it was, and it said, um, you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. Wow. This is through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of our God. Mm. And, like, when we make the decision, we get justified. You know, mm. It's all good, like, Jesus died on the cross so he could wear... Uh, the penalty of our sin, our guilt, our condemnation, all that shame. And then there's that journey of sanctification. But then I also think there's a, a journey of, um, call it formation. Mm. And I think there's three things that do form us. And it is uh, information, God, and community. Yeah. And I think the key wow. is, before stepping back into that dark place or that old world, is being properly formed. Mm. Yeah. So you can walk back in there and you're not being influenced by it. Yeah. You can just go in there, it's not influencing you because you've been formed and then you can just walk back out where you can be with those people in that dark situation and then you're not getting influenced by what they're doing and you can just walk back out again. Mm. Wow. That is so amazing. There are so many questions to ask, but one there are. that... Like, <laughs> and lots that you've answered. Yeah, so and like wow. so many, but one that I think that people would want to know is if there's someone listening and watching this and they have a family member or a friend yeah. who's just deep in addiction, mm -hmm. drugs or anything, but specifically drugs and meth, what would your advice be to them? Like, where do they start? Where do they start? Love should be confronting and challenging. Mm. Wow. I see so many people's parents, especially parents who have faith, they're like, I just want my my child back I just want them to find God you know mm. just to come back to faith and it's almost like if you want them to come back and have this relationship with God you have to stop being God in their lives wow. um, meaning like um, trying to trying save. to control yeah. trying yeah. to save yeah. trying to mm -hmm. bailing them out of debt all the time yeah. all right. that okay. stuff okay. it's like yeah just leave them to it. Love, yeah. love should be confronting and challenging. Wow. And it's really, if you're enabling someone, you're not loving on them, eh? Yeah. And it gets to a point with wow. people where you just have to be like, okay, I'm going to love you from a distance. Wow. But um, you can't do this to us anymore. Yeah. Wow. Let yeah. them sit in that place of pain because I know like pain is the biggest motivator to change. Wow. Yeah. Mm. If there's no pain there, then people are not going to want to change. Wow. So it's like, let them sit in that place of pain, let them feel wow. that pain, and that'll motivate them to do it, to draw a yeah. line in the sand. Yeah. To get into that place of desperation, that's what I think it's like. It's, it's almost like being blessed with a gift of desperation. Mm. Yeah. 
and really just being brought to your knees. Mm. Yeah, so. Because it's hard because people think they can save people and they spend their whole life Mm. trying to save them and bow them out and take them out of Mm. it and then they get just exhausted and disappointed and bitter towards Mm. them and yeah, yeah, so it's like you think it's good to stay close and and love and support but not be trying to save them out the whole time but just letting them know that you're there yeah. or I guess when you've got an addiction and you're on something like meth and stuff you're not emotionally aware of like the reality of someone staying by mm. you in a sense you're just doing your thing right yes. yeah just boundaries and just yeah. stick to those boundaries boundaries well. yeah. yeah like just enforce those boundaries and just have no room for budging yeah. with them mm. so did you you said you didn't see your parents for a while did how long was that probably two years wow mm. um so regarding your parents mm-hmm. like as abby said you mentioned that you didn't have a relationship with them for a while what does that look like now um like the best relationship ever really yeah it's like um jesus just healed that relationship so wow. much um, yeah. a lot of hurt i had around my relationship with my dad mm, i was yeah. like he was the most loving father but it was something inside of me that was just always pushing them away. Wow. Wow. That's just not the case, not the case anymore. Wow. So they're like my best friends. That's so oh, cool. best friends. how awesome. Um, That's yeah. amazing. My mum's um, come to faith as well. Really? Wow. Yeah, so I baptised her, I think it was last oh, October. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, yeah. I love that. So that's so cool. amazing. Um, mm. And you talked about helping other people that are going through addiction. I guess that's your motivation. But is there something else that motivates you every day when you wake up to be like, I'm doing something good, I'm making a difference. What motivates you to stay clean? Jesus gives me the motivation. Yeah. Mm. It's like, I can't do this without him. Wow. Mm. And I tell him that most mornings, I'm just like, Jesus, without you, I'm nothing. Wow. Um, I can't do life without you. I've proved it to you time and time again. I am just so weak. I need you. And it always makes me think of that scripture. What is it? Um, um, Sorry. Oh, you're good. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Mm, Therefore, I shall boast all the more, but um, all the more gladly of my weakness. The power of Jesus Christ may rest upon me. And I think... Yeah, just coming before him in my weakness every mm. day. Like, yeah, I don't have a clue how to do life. I don't know how to walk out this calling that he's placed in my mm. life. I don't know how to be a husband. I don't know how to be a dad to these children. Mm. I don't know how to be a son. And just like, just getting before him and just getting absolutely honest just every day. Wow. Yeah. I don't think there's like any point in just going in before him and being like, yeah, I've got it all together. It's mm. all good. I only need you in this area of my life, yes. that area of my life. It's like, Jesus, I need you. I can't yeah. do this. And just really inviting him into absolutely everything. Mm. And I think those are the prayers that he just loves listening to and that just really yeah. prick up his ears yeah. when we just go before him and we're just like, sometimes it gets ugly. Yeah. We just get so rigorously honest for them and just be like jesus i need you mm. and those are the prayers that i believe he loves hearing you know? and i think mm. there's there's two types of praying there's those like real vulnerable prayers where we're just performed by ourselves mm. and then there's those fancy prayers as well mm. but i just think he does absolutely <laughs> he looks fancy, past the words eh? is that why you that language those, those fancy <laughs> prayers we use around other people and stuff like that I, I just think he just loves it Mm. when we just go before him and yeah. just just truly just boast yeah in, uh, in his weak and in, in our weakness yeah oh, man. Just, oh that's amazing it is amazing you're so awesome mm. so it is awesome. such a privilege to have you here yeah. like so beyond and i know that this is just a snippet really of your journey yeah. and the hardship and the s- scary moments and the fast moments mm. that you've actually experienced and the things that the thoughts that you've thought and the things that you've seen um people will never understand um what actually a miracle is that you're sitting here on Mm. this couch speaking good news Mm. and hope um for a better tomorrow Mm -hmm. and 
it is an honor um, to be in this room with you. Yeah. And here at Human As, we love to thank people for helping us with our journey. And I'm sure there's a lot of people. A lot of people. Um, but if you could just choose one to honor in this moment, um, we're going to look into this beautiful camera and it is capturing you as well. <laughs> so, hi, Jna. Um, if you could just, yeah, honor them. Um, I don't know, honor my mum no. for um, never giving up on me. And no. um, I know she was praying for me, even though she um, was still a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> she was uh, she was praying for me. So mm. yeah, thanks, mum, for never never stopping praying for me. And um, yeah, God heard all those prayers and um, in the secret place. So thank you. Mm. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. That is action done. You are one heck of a man.